All right, well, welcome to Orleans Audubon Society's Beginning Bird Course, Part Two, which is Introduction to Ornithology. Uh, Louisiana is a great place to watch and study birds. And it's possible to see about 450 species in the state, such as these wonderful black-bellied whistling ducks. Uh, these are striking ducks that have been making a range expansion into Louisiana and other parts of the southeastern United States. And they're called whistling ducks because they make a crazy wee, 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 wee noise all the time. Uh, just a brief introduction to who I am. Uh, I'm the president of the Orleans Audubon Society, and I uh, have a long-term study on swallowtail kites. Uh, I have been, or, or rather birds have kept me spellbound since the early age of four. And by the time I made it to kindergarten, I was determined that I was gonna marry a cardinal. But instead I settled on this guy here, Tom Colson. <laughs> uh, so let's see, I received my bachelor's and master's degrees in biology from the University of New Orleans and a PhD in ecology and evolution from Tulane University. And my main research project is a long-term study on the swallowtail kite that was the subject of my dissertation. And there, this is the cover of the conservation brochure that we have posted on the Orleans Audubon Society website. Last week, Wendy Reiner gave the first part of this course. She gave us a great introduction to getting started in birding and uh, provided tips about binoculars and field guides and eBird and gardening with native plants to attract birds. If you missed her class or want to review it, uh, a recording is available on the Orleans Audubon Society's YouTube channel. You just have to type in Orleans Audubon Society and also on Orleans Audubon Society's Facebook page. And you can also find links on our website under birds and under events. And the there are also a number at our at both at all of these sites, we also have recordings that I would like to recommend to you, like Beginning Birding Part One, uh, Backyard Birding, and More, Bird Louisiana, Confusing Fall Warblers, Raptor Identification Workshop. These will all be helpful to you in learning to bird. Uh, the course has two handouts. I think most of you should have received those today by email. If you don't have them, you can go to our website at jjaudubon.net and go under the birding tab and under birding workshops and courses. The handouts are posted there. Uh, they have hot links in them so that you can click on the blue links and go to those websites. There's information on joining Orleans Audubon Society and signing up for our email announcements on our MailChimp landing page. And also there's a link to our YouTube channel where you can find recordings. I'd also like to encourage everybody to consider joining the Louisiana Ornithological Society if you are really getting into birding and wanna be more serious about it. There's information there on these handouts. Another handout has information about local birding destinations, for instance, um, Audubon and City Park and places that you could go on your own. And both handouts have plenty of information about birding guides. Okay, to get started with the, the nuts and bolts of this, this class, ornithology. Ornith means bird and ology means the study of. So ornithology is indeed the science of birds. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, birds include a number of crazy looking animals, including penguins, uh, but there are flying animals that are not birds. For example, bats are of course mammals. Uh, all birds have feathers like these emperor penguins. You know, it may look like it's got a coat of fur, but indeed these are feathers and uh, mammals have fur like this giant fruit bat. There is such a fantastic diversity of birds. Uh, by some accounts, there are estimated 8,800 birds or other estimates are that there are over 10,000 species of birds, like 10,200 species. And then there are even some other estimates that say there may be 18,000 species of birds 
taking into account those that have not yet been discovered and those that are cryptic species that we would need a DNA analysis to identify. Now here we have the world's smallest and largest representatives. So um, in this corner, we have the, the gorgeous bee hummingbird that's from Cuba. Uh, the, the smallest of all birds weighing only six to seven hundredths of an ounce. That's less than a dime. And this little guy is less than two inches tall. And uh, in this corner, we have the heavyweight champion, the common ostrich from Africa. And a big male can weigh up to 346 pounds and stand up to nine feet tall. But there have been bigger birds on the planet. Uh, so I'm going to take just a minute to talk about evolutionary relationships of birds because it's pretty fascinating. The archosaurs were the ruling reptiles uh, that are an ancient lineage that gave rise to both the crocodilians and birds. So crocodilians, including this, these American alligators, those are the uh, closest living relatives to birds. Uh, the archosauria also gave rise to some really fantastic animals like uh, the theropod dinosaurs, which include the tyrannosaurs and the velociraptors. You know, that you don't want these guys in your kitchen, right? Um, so these were some huge carnivorous dinosaurs that are indeed relatives to birds. So here's another theropod meat-eating dinosaur. And I wanted to use this example just to mention that many of the, this one was this one was 10 to 15 feet tall and uh, we're now learning that and it was from the late Cretaceous period we're now learning that many of the dinosaurs were feathered in this group and in fact it's even possible so the theropod dinosaurs a lot of them were probably had um, at least downy feathers and uh, the archosaurs may have even had some down there's there's now some fossil evidence of that, the, the, the really primitive group or the really basal group. Feathers uh, were a source of, th this was not a flighted animal. In this case, they were a source of insulation and may have helped to cover the young too, eggs and young. So birds are really the surviving dinosaurs. Birds evolved from these small carnivorous feathered dinosaurs that were in the theropod group in the late Jurassic. And this group was known as the Manoraptoran theropod dinosaurs. And there were some giant examples, but they soon went through an incredible shrinking period. Do y'all remember Lily Tomlin, the incredible shrinking woman? Well, these were the incredible shrinking theropod dinosaurs. And uh, they really went through a great speciation in the Cretaceous period. So who was really our first bird? That's a question that's of much debate. Uh, was it Archaeopteryx? I mean, you know, that's what I certainly learned, that Archaeopteryx lithographica was the first bird and that it appeared in the fossil record about 150 million years ago in the Jurassic. <clears throat> and it had, it was a crazy bird that had a jaw full of teeth. It had claws on its wings and it had a long bony tail, among other unusual features. And this is a kind of close up of like a modern bird tail versus Archaeopteryx's longer tail with feathers on both sides of it. And uh, so is it really in the clade um, Avalae? And the reason that that's interesting is because that's what we call the modern birds. Some recent fossils that have been found uh, that are close to Archaeopteryx and maybe a close relative kind of suggests that maybe Archaeopteryx indeed was a close relative to birds, but that it was not in the direct line um, of ancestry. Let's see. So uh, what are birds? First of all, birds are animals. It really kind of bugs me when I'm reading something and it says animals and birds, as if birds aren't animals. Birds are definitely animals. They are vertebrates, which means they have a backbone. They are endothermic, which means that they're able to regulate their own body temperature. They're warm blooded the way we are. And all birds have feathers. Their feathers serve as insulation. And for many birds, uh, it's also a lightweight surface that enables flight. And in some birds, it's also 
a display, used for display. And some birds it's used for producing sounds as well. Uh, the, this is a Harris hawk. And what, it, what it, I wanted to talk about here is that all modern birds have beaks. If you study the evolution of birds, that is not the case for some of our early birds. Many of them had jaws full of teeth or a combination of some teeth and beak and maybe teeth on one jaw and not the other. Uh, the beak is, so there's a bone that comes, this is, there's a, there's a joint here and there's a bone that comes down to about here in the bird's beak. And then it's covered with a horny keratinaceous plate. And so that's what we actually see is we, you know, that's covering the bone. And keratin is made out of the same thing that your fingernails are made out of. So all modern birds have beaks. None of the modern birds have teeth. But there are some fascinating ancient birds that uh, were toothed animals. All birds lay eggs. All birds have the same mode of reproduction that they lay a hard shelled egg and incubate that egg and hatch out of an egg. In mammals, for example, we have egg laying mammals, you know, but in all birds, we can say that for sure they all lay eggs. Now this is an ostrich egg. And what I love about this one is because it's so huge, you can see all the pores in the egg, especially in the shadow here. Um, the egg pores allow the embryo as it's developing to be able to lose water. It needs, the egg needs to lose about 18% um, of its weight to 20% of its weight to hatch. So it gradually loses some water out of these pores. And it also allows it to breathe through here. While the embryo is developing, it has a blood vessel network that grows around it and pushes up against the inside of the shell. And that blood vessel network is thin little capillaries that allow the um, egg, the embryo to take in oxygen from the outside and to expel carbon dioxide that it's building up as it grows. So it's actually how it breathes when it's developing until its lungs start working. Oh, okay, this is a baby Harris's hawk. Um, my husband and I are falconers and we also breed Harris's hawks. So this is um, the uh, egg here. This is a Harris hawk egg. They're about the size of a chicken egg. They have a light blue cast though. And uh, there's the bird has a little egg tooth. Some birds have two egg teeth, like on each one on each mandible. Uh, and they use that to crack a hole in the egg. And after they crack a, an initial hole in the egg, their lungs start breathing and working. And they're shutting down the blood vessel network that was pushed up against the shell of the egg. And they're absorbing those blood vessels. And so that, that network of blood vessels is shutting down and the lungs are starting to work. Then they kind of work like a can opener after resting for a couple of days and work their way around cracking out of the egg within a couple of hours, boom, they're out. And they look pretty dinosaur-like when they hatch out. And it takes in within an hour or so, they're all fluffy and cute like that. So the egg is quite a miracle. And, and it's, the egg is an adaptation to flight because you don't have to carry around that heavy embryo in flight. I don't... So other adaptations for flight include in this pigeon skeleton, we can see that birds have a lot of fused bones. They also have a reduced number of bones and they have an expanded keel, especially the ones that have the power of flight. So the keel is uh, an expansion off of the sternum, our breastbone. And that is where the big flight muscles attach, the pectoral muscles that power flight. Some other adaptations for flight, uh, birds, well, most birds anyway, have hollow bones, those that can fly. And this, there's an argument as to whether they make the bird lighter, but I believe that they do. And they also um, allow for air to come in here. And we'll talk about the air sacs in a minute, but it gives, birds have very strong, very light bones for their size. Oh yeah, wait, one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, some of the birds that are our divers like anhingas and cormorants that, that are able to fly, uh, they have much heavier bones. 
so here's the, uh, we're looking at the back of a pigeon here, and I just wanted to mention some unusual features of their skeleton. In most birds, these thoracic vertebrae, the vertebrae in the chest cavity are uh, fused. And then there's a little bit of mobility here. And then their pelvic girdle is this crazy thing called the syncacrum. And so it's uh, fused vertebrae and fused pelvic bones, the syncacrum. Uh, there, uh, and I mentioned already that this is the sternum here, that it has this keel or this uh, expanded breastplate for muscle attachment. This is showing the wing here, like here's the humerus and here's the radius and the ulna. The ulna has these little marks on it here. Those are where um, secondary feathers are attaching. They're actually rooted on the bone. And oh, the other thing that's, you know, the Pope's nose on the turkey, the pygo style, that's an intro, the bird tail is a very interesting structure there that is very short. And uh, that's where all the tail feathers are attaching in a fan shaped arrangement. The other thing I wanted to, oh, you, here you can see on the ulna again, the, um, you know, the ulna is the one that has the elbow that it's, you can see those markings there on the bone where the secondaries are attaching. And then the primaries are attaching on these bones here. And look at these ribs. They have these crazy uncinate processes, which are helping with respiration. And this is the coracoid. So the, the coracoid is serving as a brace and then there's the uh, furculum. The furculum is the wishbone. The furculum actually serves like a spring to help with the, so the wings are kind of doing like that. I mean, or rather the furculum is flexible. We, we, you know, we think of bones as how can they be flexible, but it actually is during flight. And uh, okay, there's the keel, another shot of the keel. Some other flight adaptations. Uh, for our flighted birds, they have very short intestines. Guts are heavy. So if you compare it to something like a mammal with a, like a nutria that's a grain eater, they've got, a, they're a huge sack of guts, basically. Birds have very short, dry intestines. They're, they excrete uric acid. So what, what their poop is, basically, is much drier than what a mammal's, mammals, are, we excrete urea in urine. So they're excreting a drier uric acid. They have a very highly efficient circulatory system. And uh, they have the, the highest inefficiency respiratory system of any terrestrial vertebrate. Pretty incredible respiratory system that helps to fuel flight. So let's look at the, the bird's heart. Avian means bird. We have a, an avian heart diagram compared to a human heart. Guess what? Birds have a four-chambered heart. It's a very strong heart. And the bird's heart is very large relative to its body size, and that's to supply the nutrients and oxygen needed to power flight. Uh, birds have nine air sacs, and they are air sacs are these, they're attached to the lungs. They're very thin-walled. I mean, they're like, looks like, clear membrane that you can see through. And they're filled with air and they help to ventilate the lungs, kind of like bell a bellows system for the lungs. In rehabilitation, if you ever have a bird that's suffered a fall, it may have ruptured one of its air sacs. And that can, and then what happens is it just keeps filling with air and ballooning up under the skin. And you can actually take a sterile needle and pop that and put pressure on it and deflate it. And uh, you may have to put a pressure bandage on it to keep it from filling and it'll eventually seal over. Uh, I've certainly seen that happen with the clavicular air sac here, intraclavicular. The bird lung, this is a really kind of primitive diagram. Like let's pretend we're inside the bird lung versus a human lung. You may remember from your basic biology that in, in human lungs, you know, the air comes in the same way that it goes out. And the place of gas exchange is the alveoli. Each little alveolus has a blood supply surrounding it. And that's where you exchange the carbon dioxide and um, oxygen. Well, in birds, it's different. The air comes in one way and then goes out a different way. So that it's uh, when it's moving through the lung, it's moving only in one direction and the blood vessels are doing a counter current gas exchange. The blood vessels are flowing in the opposite direction that the air is flowing. 
So in the principles of diffusion, that makes for a stronger gradient. And if you don't remember that, don't worry. It just, it's a highly efficient lung that works really well. And the uh, air sacs, as I say, are, are trying, are, are helping with it. Now in the, in the actual, um, oh, never mind that, it's pretty complicated, but the, the place of gas exchange for birds is the parabronchi. So that's sort of the equivalent of our alveoli. And the, the capillaries there are very small and it, that also helps to have it be a very efficient form of gas exchange. And this is just a little trivia thing here in case you ever need to know this on Jeopardy or whatever, that red blood cells of birds are nucleated and that's really true for most fish and amphibians and reptiles as well. In humans and uh, many mammals, the, uh, the nucleus is expelled during the development of the red blood cells. So when our red blood cells are mature and in circulation, they lack the nucleus, but bird blood cells are nucleated. What kind of senses do birds have? Well, they have the same senses that we do. In some cases, they're more developed or less developed. It depends on the bird species. And uh, for example, turkey vultures are one of the few birds that have a develop, well-developed sense of smell. Uh, the other vultures apparently don't. And they've done experiments where turkey vultures have been able to find their carrion by using the sense of smell alone, whereas black vultures uh, have to find it by sight. The kiwi is another example of a bird that has a, an ex, exquisite sense of smell and their nose endings are at the tip of their long, crazy bill. They're very strange. What kind of sight do birds have? Uh, most of them see much better than we do. Uh, the birds of prey, for example, can see at least eight to 10 times better than we can see farther than we can. You know, eyes like an eagle or eyes like a hawk. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some nocturnal vision later, but. In general, birds tend to have more cone cells in their eyes and cone cells help with color and fine detail vision. Some birds have two phobias. Uh, birds do have a sense of touch and many of their feathers have specialized feathers called within them called phyloplumes that have a nerve ending and they help to let the, the bird know when any of its feathers are out of place or when they're flat flies and things or lice crawling around inside them that they need to preen out. Uh, they have a sense of taste that is generally not well developed. And I already mentioned the sense. Oh, and their sense of hearing is particularly well developed in the owls, but they all have a decent sense of hearing. I wanted to take a minute to talk about imprinting because it really helps people to understand whether what should be done with a, with a baby bird. At Orleans Audubon, we get a lot of calls about baby birds that need rescue. And, you know, it's really tempting to just say, oh, it's on the ground, the cat's gonna get it. I need to pick it up. I need to bring it inside. I need to bring it to the Audubon Zoo. I need to do this, blah, blah, blah. Well, the best thing to do if it's not injured is to try to return it to its parents. And so, and, and that, the main reason that that's the, the case is that if you hand raise a bird, it generally becomes imprinted on humans and then it's mentally compromised. It actually grows up thinking that it's a human. Instead of imprinting on its own species, it now really believes it's a human. So you don't want a golden eagle flying around thinking it's a human. It also isn't a good idea for a mockingbird either. So anything you can do to try to get that bird back to its parents or in a situation where its parents could care for it back in the nest, build an artificial nest. This is a baby barred owl that fell out of its nest. And uh, somebody called me about it and they knew where the nest cavity was. I spent a couple of minutes talking to the power company. They got a bucket truck over there and returned the owl to the cavity within 45 minutes and its parents took care of it. This is a baby red-shouldered hawk that John Nelson rescued and he built an artificial nest platform because the nest was not accessible and put the baby up there. And this baby's able to thermoregulate on its own. So it would be okay to put it in an artificial nest platform. If it was a really young baby, you wouldn't be able to do that because there are probably other babies and the parents couldn't split their time between them. But anyway, uh, so that the parents could come feed the young. 
Remember what I said about the bird's sense of smell, poorly dis- developed sense of smell. There's that old wives tale that drives me nuts that oh, if you touch the baby bird, it'll smell like humans and the parents will never come back. Well, maybe that's just something parents tell their kids to leave the birds alone. I don't know, but it is not true. Birds have a poor sense of smell and they want to take care of their young anyway. I mean, as soon as that baby starts begging for food, they're going to be back to it. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about bird behavior in addition to imprinting. Um, Wendy had mentioned migration and that's one thing that I study. And I was just gonna talk really briefly about swallowtail kite migration that Orleans Audubon and myself are studying using GPS satellite transmitters. Uh, We are doing this in collaboration with the Avian Research and Conservation Institute, our colleagues in Gainesville, Florida. And this is the back of a swallowtail kite, an adult. We fit the bird with a GPS satellite transmitter. These are two solar panels that power the battery. So theoretically the transmitter could remain operational for the life of the bird. And it reports back to uh, the via Argo satellites. And then we download Doppler and GPS locations. So we get really accurate fixes on the bird 10 times a day. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it shows us like where the bird is going exactly. Whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. And so here's a map of Lacombe, the, swall- the male swallowtail kite that we tracked. And these are showing his trips down and his return trips up. And uh, so swallowtail kites, this bird nested in Lacombe down here. And he spent the winter on the Paraná River in uh, southern Brazil. And the round trip migration is this incredible like 10,000 mile trip. And they, the birds have to make this every year. Uh, swallowtail kites, we know they don't breed in their first year. We know they don't breed in their second year. They, they may breed in their third year, uh, possibly. So they have delayed age at first breeding. So they have to have gone through at least a couple of these 10,000 mile migrations before they're able to breed. So this 10,000 mile round trip, what does that really mean? Like if you took a journey to the core of the earth, that would be about 4,000 miles. And if we look at the distance around the earth, uh, circumferences, it's somewhere around 25,000 miles. So it's a, it's a long way. <laughs> it's pretty incredible what they do. Whoops. And uh, this is another, this is the track from another bird that we tagged, Pearl, Mississippi. And one of the things we've learned is that in spring migration, the birds, it's a race to make it back to the breeding grounds. And the birds are often going straight across the Gulf of Mexico instead of following the overland route. Well, this can be dangerous. And and what happened to Pearl, Mississippi is um, in the spring of 2013, he hit a strong uh, cold front that was moving across the Gulf of Mexico. And he he was so close. He almost made it to shore, and instead he had to turn back to Texas and come around this way. Uh, he still he still bred that year, but we found that unfortunately some of the swallowtail kites, when they hit a strong enough cold front, just battle strong headwinds for days and nights on end, and eventually get exhausted and drown. And of course, imagine if you're a hummingbird or a warbler, uh, these spring migration cold fronts can be quite deadly. They can be selection events actually. Swallowtail kites cross the central Andes in Colombia at one of its highest points where it's, uh, you know, 3,000, 3,500 meters and and higher. And really that's nothing to a kite. (laughs) It sounds fantastic and amazing to us, but you know, this is their bird's eye view and yeah, you know, they're just happy to be there. Okay, so moving along, I'd like to talk about some identification methods. Let's really get into the nitty gritty of birding. You wanna use field marks and we're gonna review some field marks like this red cockaded woodpecker has this white cheek and uh, laddered back. We can use behavior like we can tell that it's a woodpecker because of the way it's hanging on the side of the tree. It's got two toes facing in the front, two toes in the back. It's using its tail to prop itself up against the tree. That's a very woodpeckery thing to do. Vocalizations, they make a little weird call. We could maybe listen to that. We could also look at the range map 
and see what woodpeckers are found in that range, which ones are the plausible woodpeckers. And we can look at the habitat. Some birds have very general habitats, but in the case of the red cockaded woodpecker, it's an endangered species that really relies on a super endangered habitat, and that is the longleaf pine savanna that used to be throughout the southeastern United States. And so here's an example of a field guide where we look at the range map, and the range maps are color-coded like purple means year-round, and it depends on the field guide what what those particular ones mean. But you can look at these range maps here and see, well, here's the belted kingfisher that's found in North America. Could I see a ringed kingfisher here? Well, they're really from Central and South America. And guess what? It is possible though, because there was a ringed kingfisher, for example, that was hanging out in uh, Lake Martin, the Nature Conservancy preserved Cypress Island for a while. I don't know if it's still there. And uh, green kingfisher, you might be able to luck out and see that in Brownsville or somewhere in South Texas. But gen so you can see that it just makes it into Louisiana. So referring to those range maps, especially when you're a beginner, is a really good idea before you open your mouth and tell somebody what you saw. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some of those identifying field marks. This is a Swainson's warbler. It's a, a woodland warbler, and you can see that it has a white supercilium. All the field guides in the beginning have the topography of the bird, um, and you really want to study the field marks and topography. It's just something you have to learn. The crown and the lores are the, uh, so Swainson's warblers have dark lores. That's the space between the eye and the bill there. Here's a song sparrow. They have a lot of field marks. Uh, they have this grayish nape that's striped, and they've got a, super, a gray supercilium, they've got an eye ring, they've got a white throat, uh, a streaked breast, the sides are streaked. And if we look at this up close, look, it's got a median crown stripe, uh, it's got a lateral throat stripe, this is the mallar here. This is the mustachial stripe. And I have to admit that sometimes I get these mixed up and I have to look at the topography again. Just wait, which one was which? The auricular or the ear patch, the eye line here, uh, the supercilium. Uh, this is a brown thrasher. That's a fantastic looking bird. It has very striking wing bars, has a beautiful yellow iris, very long tail and short wings, long curved beak. Here's a northern parula. We can see that it has white eye arcs. Some birds have an eye ring. This one just has arcs. Notice it's got a two-tone bill, that it's got a green triangle on its back, that it's got two white wing bars that are pretty prominent. If we could see the front, we'd see that it has a necklace, that especially the, um, the males have a really well-developed necklace with a little bit of orange in it. Uh, the lower mandible, I think, is, I mentioned, is yellow. Look at their tarsi. They have uh, uh, the, the scaled part of the leg, the tarsus, is black with yellow feet. They have a lot of spectacular field marks. A few learning tips that I think help me anyway. Um, I always tell people, let me hear you say it. Uh, when you're studying birds, it's really good to say their names out loud, especially birds that have compound names, but it really helps you to remember them. It can help you to write them down as well. Uh, if you're trying to learn the bird's sounds, mimic their vocalizations. Maybe don't do it when anybody else is listening, or maybe do, you know, but, but it can really help you to remember what the bird sounds like. Uh, and you can make field, uh, I'm going to talk about field notes in a minute. And you can explore a species by going to eBird. I highly encourage everybody to get an eBird account. It's free. Get one if you don't have one, because it allows you to get to parts of eBird that aren't available to the public. But just go to ebird.org and go to explore species and type in a species name and it's going to give you, it'll return all the photographs and recordings of that bird. If you sign in, it'll show you your recordings as well and your, uh, where you've seen the bird. And then the other thing that I would recommend is to repeat things and review things, especially review birds after you've seen them. Try to learn a little bit about the bird, just not but beyond just its name. We can all improve our observational skills by documenting our observations. One of the things that beginners have the hardest time on too is, okay, I'm, I saw a bird that's kind of rare, I need to describe it. 
And, and the handout provides some information about describing birds, where you need to go to report a rear bird. But the main thing is you have to be honest and try to remember what is it you actually saw. Like it's easy to look at the field guide and say, oh yeah, it's got yellow undertail coverts. Well, did you actually see the undertail coverts? Or are you now augmenting your description with things that the field guide shows you? So it's really a good idea to take field notes and to make your own sketches, even if your sketches aren't good, like the tail was long and pointed or the, the wings were short and fat. Uh, and to take photographs. Some of these uh, mirrorless cameras now make it really easy to zoom in on birds. Uh, to, to record a vocalization, you can go back and look up, determine what the bird was later. But also uh, eBird and other databases need more recordings of birds and our smartphones make it pretty easy to do that. And document your observations on eBird. I encourage you to do that. Upload your recordings and your uh, photographs. And then you have this permanent record of your birding adventures because eBird's going to save it for you. Uh, let's see. I use, um, for recordings, I use the Road app. Um, and Cornell had recommended that. Cornell has a lot of recommendations on their website about recordings. And then I use Audacity for editing any of my uh, recordings. It's, it's really handy software and it's free. I like the stuff that's free. All right, let's talk about uh, some vocalizations of birds. This is a lovely male prothonotary warbler. The reason the back of his head is a little bit messed up is uh, Donata put water on it because we were doing an aging thing called sculling where you move the feathers out of the way and you can see the skin and what's beneath the skin on the bird. But anyway, this prothonotary warbler says, sweet, 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 a little more sweet. So it helps to have some kind of saying to help you remember the vocalizations of a bird. Donata says that the Swainson's warbler is saying, I'll meet you at three o'clock and it's Vocalization sounds like <whistles> this is a white-eyed vireo, and uh, he, <laughs> the white-eyed vireo says, "Chick, bring me a beer." <laughs> it's a very distinctive call. The uh, adults have a white iris; the young have a brown iris. They're very common, gorgeous little birds. Just a word on plumages and molt, and I'll be talking about this through the throughout my talk is that many birds exhibit sexual dimorphism. Um, it can mean that the one of the sex is larger than the other. It can mean that one has a longer bill. Uh, in most cases, there are at least plumage differences. So in the cardinal, for example, the male is a lot more bright red and the female is more camouflaged, uh, duller colored because she's the one spending more time on the nest. Um, so it makes it harder, though, for us to learn birds when there are so many plumages. And uh, some of the plumages are age specific. So in some birds, we'll see that they start off as a juvenile plumage that's more camouflaged. And then in a year, they get a new or in six months, they get a new plumage that may be their adult plumage or an intermediate plumage. So it means that you have so instead when you're learning one species, you may have males and females that have different plumages and adults and juveniles that have different plumages, it can be a lot to learn. And uh, some birds even have seasonal plumages where uh, depending on the time of year, like many of our ducks are eclipsed in the winter time, they have duller plumages then. So uh, another thing that is confusing for birders, depending on whether you have the latest field guide or not, the names of your birds may not exactly match what eBird has or what's on the state list, checklist, because names change all the time. And that's because our study of how birds are related is constantly changing as new studies become available. So two of the main reasons that names change would be uh, that names have become politically incorrect, like this uh, long-tailed duck used to be called the old squaw, and it's now the long-tailed duck. Um, sometimes it was named after naturalists and we're moving away from that now. Not, I don't like that, but the, you know, we're starting to instead give it a, dis a descriptive name versus perhaps naming it after the person who discovered it. Uh, and then there's this thing called lumping and splitting. Lumping and splitting means that, okay, we had this 
the species that we thought was all the same, but somebody went in and did a pretty comprehensive analysis. Maybe they compared the bird songs and maybe they compared the DNA and found out that these two birds that look alike are actually very different and don't interbreed. And so in that case, we had one species that was lumped together and we're gonna split it into two species. And in other cases, species that we thought were different over different parts of the world, like the, uh, this is the white-tailed kite. Sometimes it's been called the black-shouldered kite. Uh, it was lumped with other kites to become the white-tailed kite, but it, it has been split. It's gone back and forth. So uh, be mindful of that. eBird has regular updates. They're, they're one of the places that you can check to see what the latest news is. And I included some links on the handout about that. Okay, we're gonna have a little bit of biology here about uh, phylogenetics. So how are birds classified? It used to be that they were only classified by taxonomy where we were just looking at physical characteristics. How did their plumage, was their plumage similar? Were the, was the bill similar? Was the foot structure similar? But now we're moving more towards phylogenetics or a combination of looking at the phylo, how genetically, what's the family tree of the bird, and also the taxonomy, um, the, the, the physical characteristics. So physical traits, behavioral traits, and then in phylogenetics, we're looking at DNA. The DNA can come from the nucleus of the cell or it can also come from the uh, mitochondria. The mitochondria, remember those are the powerhouses of the cell. And so they're producing energy for us. So there's the, the mitochondrial DNA usually only comes from the female. So it's considered to be more conserved. It's inherited from one, uh, it's only passed down by the mothers. So we use phylogenetic, people, people study the similarities in the DNA to produce these things called phylogenetic trees. So it's an ancestry tree basically. And this one was just redone recently for the ratites. Um, the birds are developed, the modern birds are divided into two super orders, the paleo, paleonathes and the neonates. The paleonates are the old jaws, so that would be all these birds here, are elephant birds that are extinct, the kiwis, the emus, cassowaries, tinamous, the moas which are extinct, the rias, the ostriches. There were some gigantic birds that lived on this planet. And the biggest was probably the Malagasy elephant bird. If we look at avian taxonomy and phylogenetics, uh, this is the structure. There are other classifications. There are other categories in here, but the main ones are that birds are in the animal kingdom, kingdom animalia. They are in the phylum chordata, which means they have, oops, sorry. They have a backbone, they're chordates. They're in the class eight, which also includes some, Never mind. Class. They're in the class aves, which is all the modern birds. And then when we divide them up, each type of bird, there are different orders of birds. So the pelican is in the order pelicaniformes and uh, orders always end in aformes. They're in the family Pelicanidae. Families always end in a day. And each bird has its own scientific name, which is genus and species. Scientific names are supposed to be italicized or underlined. Pelicanus occidentalis is the scientific name of the brown pelican. And so why would you care if you're a birder? Well, because the field guides, for example, are always structured according to the taxonomy and phylogenetics. And uh, when you're learning the birds, you may have to look some things up by their common name and their scientific name. The field guides all provide that. Okay, and I wanted to mention too that like we consider the birds of prey, hawks and the hawks and, and falcons used to be all lumped together in the same taxonomic group. But when a genetic study was done by Hackett et al. in 2008, they found a really comprehensive study. 
they found that the falcons actually um, were close, more closely related to parrots and passerines and seriamas. That's a seriama there. And that the uh, hawks were cl more closely related to owls and, and mouse birds and such, and, and to the new world vultures. So your field guide, if it's a little older, may not reflect this change, or it may, but uh, they are an example of convergent evolution. In other words, some of the predatory characteristics that we see in falcons, like their hooked beak and their sharp talons, and we see in owls and in the hawks and the eagles, it's a result of evolution shaping them in the same pathway, but they're not close relatives. So it's not the result of them being a close, they are related, but they're not close, close. You can see they're all in the green tree here, but they're not as closely related as we thought they once were. The order Accipitriformes includes the wonderful secretary bird from Africa. And it also includes the uh, buzzards and eagles and harriers and kites and the old world vultures. And then the, the osprey is in its own family, as is the secretary bird. The answeriformes are our ducks, geese, and swans. And uh, this is, these are mallards. We can see that the, the male mallard has this gorgeous green head, and the female is much more camouflaged. The males are also a little larger. Uh, the galliforms are our grouse and pheasants, and this is the northern bobwhite that we have here in Louisiana. So galliformes, again, is the order name. And what I'm doing here is I'm just going to run through some of the orders that are common to Louisiana. The pediciformes are the um, grebes, and of course we have the pied bill grebe here. In wintertime, we have some other grebe species as well. Pied bill grebes are common in the city in Audubon Park. Columbiformes are our pigeons and doves. And uh, the morning dove is our native dove. Of course, we used to have the passenger pigeon as well. This is the nest of a morning dove, and you can see its baby is tucked in under it there. Notice that morning doves have a beautiful blue eye ring, and this is some iridescence on its neck here. The cuculiformes are the cuckoos, and in this country we have the yellow-billed cuckoo. It's something of a nest parasite, which means it occasionally will lay its eggs in other birds' nests, but, but rarely. Uh, so this is a, a yellow-billed cuckoo that's an adult. This one's a juvenile that's coming into its adult plumage. Notice in the adult, the beautiful fleshy yellow eye ring. And notice that there's some rufous on the primaries and secondaries on the wing. Uh, and the outer tail feathers have some white in them. Some field marks, kind of slightly curved wing. The caprimulgiforms are the night jars and the hummingbirds and the swifts. Uh, these birds all have small feet and uh, the, the, this is a common nighthawk. The nighthawks are, uh, have a really huge gape. When they open their mouth, they ca their, their large gape is for catching flying insects. They have very camouflaged feathers. Uh, this is the uh, another example of the caprimulgiforms, the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is the male ruby-throated hummingbird, and it has it's the one that has the red gorget. The juveniles and the females uh, have a white throat, and the nest of a hummingbird is really an incredible structure. The hummingbird builds the nest out of a, 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 makes a cup that's about the size of a man's smoking pipe, and uh, makes it out of grasses, weaves them together, and takes spider webs and ties in, uh, and lines it with plant down, and takes spider webs and ties in lichens from trees and to decorate the outside of the nest and make it camouflage so it's very difficult to detect. Uh, ruby throats usually lay two eggs, and the, the bills on the babies start out really short. These guys are starting it, but you can see that the bill is nowhere near as long as the adult yet, and uh, they're, they're attended, the nest and, and the incubation and the raising of the young is done entirely by the female in this particular species. 
some of the words that you'll hear people talk about, like you might say people hear people talking about an Archilochus hummingbird, which that's the genus that ruby throat is, or this is a Salasporus hummingbird. And you're like, what the heck are they talking about? Well, what that means is that it's a bird that they didn't get a good enough look at to identify, or maybe the plumage isn't allowing them to identify it's a species, so they can only nail it down to genus. And so Salasporus is the genus for the Calliope hummingbird. And this is a female that, you know, she's fairly dull colored, but that's how the females are. But you can tell that it's got a very small, it's a very small hummingbird with a very uh, small beak. And in the case of the ruby throat, you, you might hear them talk about an archilochus hummingbird. And that might mean that they have a hummingbird that's coming to the feeder that's either a black chin hummingbird that, that doesn't have the black chin like a female, or maybe it's a, a female or a juvenile ruby throat. And so if they didn't get a good enough look at it, they would call it just by the genus name. Okay, then we go to the gruiforms, which would be the rails and coots and such. And here is uh, one of my favorites, the, the purple gallinule. And this is a bird that you can see in the summertime. Uh, this picture was taken at the Bayou Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge in New Orleans East. What a gorgeous bird. Okay, then we have the charadriformes, which are the plovers and sandpipers, gulls, terns, and shorebirds. This is a big group of birds. And here we have a killdeer. A killdeer is a type of plover that you probably have encountered in parking lots and, and such. Uh, they, they do, a, if they've got babies or eggs around, they do a broken wing distraction thing. To, they, the bird will flutter and act like it's hurt and try to lure you away from its eggs. So if it's going one way, you know the baby and the eggs or the eggs are the other, in the exact opposite direction. So look at the gorgeous uh, field marks on the, the killdeer, including this beautiful eye ring and look at the bands on the breast, the, the two bands there, two dark bands. And it says, kill thee, kill thee. Here are some other shorebirds. This show, you can compare here an American avocet to a black neck stilt. The black neck stilts are here year round and they breed here. The avocets are only here in the winter time usually. You can see that the American avocet, these, these birds are really similarly shaped and they're about the same height. The American avocet has an up curved bill, whereas the black neck stilt has a very straight bill. Note the pink legs on the black neck stilt, <laughs> crazy little things. Uh, this is a greater yellow legs. And sometimes you might hear somebody say they had a Tringa spa or a yellow legs spa. But well, when they say spa, that's an abbreviation for species. And so what that means is, yeah, it was, may, maybe I saw a big group of them and I didn't go through and count how many were greater yellow legs and how many were lesser yellow legs. So I might say, oh, I had a big group of yellow legs spa, or maybe they were too far away for me to be able to distinguish the fine field marks, like one's a little large, or maybe I didn't have another one there to compare them to um, the length of the bill etc. So that's another example of a spa that somebody might use or use a genus name. And here we have Wilson snipe. These are very camouflage birds. It's also a shore bird of sorts. Uh, they're here in the winter time and they're, you'll usually find them in open wet grassy fields and they have a long bill for probing into the mud for all kinds of mollusks and worms and insects very large eyed. Notice that they have big eyes that sit on the sides of their head and that helps them to detect predators. Loons are in the order Gaviformes and they're only here in winter time. Uh, we have the common loon and you can see here that, you remember that I said that birds can have different plumages depending on the time of year. Well here we have a loon, common loon that's in its winter plumage and you can see that it's a lot duller colored. And then over here, we have a loon that's in the springtime, and it's beginning to get its uh, breeding plumage, so that this is much darker and more checkered here on the back. And then here on the head, you can see that it's now got the bright red iris, and it's uh, getting, this is going to all be black, it's getting some of its breeding plumage here on the head. So just to make life 
confusing and more interesting. The loon changes its plumage in the winter time uh, versus the summer breeding plumage. Uh, okay, moving to the Sicaniaformes, these are the storks. And uh, this is the wood stork. The Saluriformes are the cormorants and hingas and frigate birds. And so here we have the double crested cormorant. They are very common here in Louisiana. And around the New Orleans area, we are sometimes now getting the neotropic cormorant here too. And there's even some evidence that they might be hybridizing in areas. So cormorants. Oh, the other birds in this group are anhingas and frigate birds. Here's an anhinga. They're um, sometimes called the snake bird. So these birds, sometimes when you see them, they'll swim underwater to pursue fish and they use this dagger-like bill to spear fish. Sometimes you see them with just their head and neck above the water, like a periscope looking up and then they go back under to, to swim and look for more fish. You'll see them drying out on the banks with their wings open. They actually have a very primitive preen gland. Their oil gland doesn't secrete as much oil as other birds. So they get wa more waterlogged. And so they really wanna sit there and dry out in the sun and they don't like it when you make them fly because they're like, oh great, now I'm just gonna go back into the water and probably get wet again. I have to go somewhere else and dry out. <laughs> but they're beautiful. So people also call them the water turkey because they have a fan tail like a turkey. Then there are the pelicaniformes. That includes the pelicans, herons, egrets, bitterns, ibis, and spoonbill. Uh, this, this order has changed a bit um, in its taxonomy, taxonomic relationships. So this is a young, this is a juvenile brown pelican. And so you can tell that it doesn't have that striking dark black, uh, dark brown and white and yellow plumage of the adult. Other wading birds that are in the pelicaniformes would, would include herons, as I said, like this black-crowned night heron. And this black-crowned night heron has its breeding plumes. See there, coming off of the little curly cues coming off of the back of his head, he's fancy. The night herons have much larger eyes than our other herons and much thicker bills and shorter necks. They're more stocky. And they're called night herons because they do most of their foraging at night. Uh, white ibis is also in this group, and uh, this is this white ibis has some juvenile plumage on its neck, uh, that it's but it's got the blue iris, so it's probably molting into adult plumage, and you can see that the adult plumage would be striking white right here. So ibis has a long curved bill for probing for crawfish and such. When people are these are dark ibis. That would be one thing that a birder might call these or plegatus spa. So at certain times a year, there, there are two dark ibis here, um, the uh, white-faced ibis and the glossy ibis. And depending on the time of year, you may not be able to distinguish them. So what you would call them is, oh, I couldn't tell for sure which species it was because they're in their winter plumage or they're juveniles. And so I'm gonna call it plegatus spa or just say that I saw some dark ibis. So that's what that means. You couldn't distinguish them between glossy ibis and um, the white-faced ibis, and they're both here. Okay, the cathartiformes, which would be the new world vultures and the condors. So I wanna emphasize again, the vultures that we have in uh, Europe and Asia and Africa, those are old world vultures and they are related to the hawks. They're in the order Occipitriformes, whereas our new world vultures are related to hawks, but they are in a different order, Cathartiformes, or they're usually placed in a different order. So we have the black vulture and the turkey vulture. The black vulture has a short squared off tail. Turkey vulture has a much longer tail that's more rounded. Uh, the turkey vulture has really two-tone wings so the second, the primaries and the secondaries are going to appear much lighter colored than the underwing, which is black. In the black vulture, it's just the primaries that appear light underneath. And another difference would be the head color. The black vulture has a black head 
And the turkey vulture has a red head like a turkey, but you can't always see that from far away. And another thing, my girlfriend sends me a million pictures. I love you, Irene, but she sends me pictures of vultures all the time and says, hey, Jen, is this an eagle? So they're similar in size, eagles a little bit bigger, but eagles hold their wings straight out like a two by four, almost like a straight board. But a vulture is gonna hold its wings in a dihedral in a shallow V and they're usually gonna rock a little bit. And turkey vultures in particular have a strong V shape to their wings. So um, that's one way to tell them apart from eagles when they're really far away. And here's a couple of pictures of the vultures up close again. And remember, it's the turkey vulture that has the keen sense of smell and the black vultures sometimes follow the turkey vultures for that very reason. And this vulture has poop on his back because he was roosting on a tower with other vultures above him. <laughs> oh, and one thing that's kind of funny about vultures is they uh, actually urinate down their legs, not really urinate, but they go to the bathroom down their legs. Their, their um, excrement is much more liquid than in most birds. And so their feet are always chalky looking. And it may be to help uh, as, as a, to cleanse, oddly enough, to cleanse their feet because of the types of carcasses they're in and out of. Okay, the Ocipitriformes are the hawk-like raptors. That would include the hawks, the kites, the harriers, and the eagles. And here we have a lovely red-shouldered hawk with one foot drawn up sitting on a, on a power line uh, along a roadside ditch. This is an adult red-shouldered hawk. It's got a banded tail. This is Fergie and she is a 10-year-old female Harris hawk and we use her in the sport of falconry. Falconry is training and hunting with a bird of prey and Fergie is captive bred. In fact, we bred her in captivity. The Harris's hawk has a number of field marks that make it easy to identify. You can see that it's dark brown all over and Notice that it's got a whole lot more rufous on its wing than does, especially on the shoulder, than does the red-shouldered hawk. That's the alarm call of a Harris hawk. Mm -hmm. And then also notice that the thighs are rufous. And when we look at her back here, we can see that she has the characteristic white rump patch. The only other bird of prey around here that has a white rump patch like that is the northern harrier. And then note that her tail is black and it ends in a white terminal band. So other field marks of the Harris hawk would be this characteristically bare face and then the tarsi or the, the, the scaled part of the leg is also bare. In some birds there are feathers there instead. So that, those are some characters that help us to identify the Harris hawk. And uh, as mentioned that she's a female. In the birds of prey the females are larger than the males, about a third larger and we can say that they have reverse sexual dimorphism. And that term is used because in most birds, the male is larger than the female, but in the birds of prey, it's the reverse. So. Now we're gonna take a look at a juvenile Harris hawk. Her name is Vixen, and she is almost a year old now. In most of the juvenile birds of prey, the plumage is more streaked, uh, more modeled looking in places, and so it helps to camouflage young birds. The colors are also duller or more earthy tones. As you can see here, she doesn't have quite as bright a rufous on the wings. And if we look at the thighs, the thighs are kind of checkered or, or streaked. And then notice that she's got all this streaking down the breast here. <laughs> so uh, also her eye color is lighter as well. And some birds pray the eye color changes. So she will molt, start molting soon. Uh, most birds of prey will molt about once a year. And so it's common for many species to go from their juvenile to adult plumage when they're about a year old. In the case of something like an eagle that has a longer development period, it may be five molts before they reach adult plumage, or five years in other words. Uh, Harris hawks are desirable in the sport of falconry because they can be hunted in a group. Most birds of prey are solitary, 
and hair socks are an exception to that rule because they actually often live in family groups where they will breed, you know, have a nest together and hunt together cooperatively. And so Tom and I are able to hunt our hawks together. All right, so back to the red-tailed hawk. And uh, I should have put a picture in here that shows the brick red tail, but um, the, the juveniles do not have a brick red tail. This is a larger hawk that's common here. Uh, mostly in winter, there are some places in Louisiana where it also nests here. Okay, moving on to the strigiformes or the owls. There are two groups of owls that are all the barn owls and grass owls of the world. They fall into the family Titanidae, very gorgeous owls. They ha all have a heart-shaped facial disc and that facial disc really functions as, in their acoustic system. It helps to funnel sound waves into their ears and their ears are located on the edges of their facial disc. And then there are the typical owls, including this barred owl, which is quite common in the swamps of Louisiana. And of course, the barred owl says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Ooh, 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 ah. Kind of, that's, that was a lame call, but anyway, something like that. This is Hammy, the great horned owl. Great horned owls are common in Louisiana and they can even be found in the middle of New Orleans. Because they're so nocturnal, they're often not detected. The great horned owl is the largest owl in Louisiana and it's named for these display feathers that look, that resemble either horns or tufts, but they are just that. They use them for expression and for camouflage. Uh, expression the way we would use our eyebrows, for example. And his actual ears are located on the edge of his facial disc and they're covered with feathers. Great horned owls can be identified by their large blocky head and their bright yellow large forward facing eyes and their big size. And you might notice too that there's a white throat patch here. And then if we look at his feathers on the back, <laughs> He's extremely camouflaged. In fact, the feather pattern here resembles the bark of an oak tree and live oaks and other oaks are some of their favorite places to spend the daytime roosting. So what an owl does when it's roosting in the daytime is it tries to detect, to avoid detection. So its camouflage helps it to hide it from things like crows and blue jays who would mob the owl if they found it, because if they see an owl, they know it's their bitter enemy and they want to try to harass it and drive it out of their territory. This is a male great horned owl and just as in the hawks, the males are smaller than the females. If this were a big uh, female great horned owl, it might stand a good head taller than what Hammy is here. Owls have exceptionally soft feathers. If you examine them under a microscope, there's an extra fringed edge to them, and that helps them to fly silently. That helps them to sneak up on their prey, and it also keeps <laughs> the noise from their feathers from interfering with their keen sense of hearing. Some owls are able to hunt by hearing alone. They also have very keen nocturnal vision. If we examine the owl's eyes, we would find that it has a higher number of rods than cones. Rods are for night vision. And so he can see much better than we can at nighttime. He can see during the daytime. Uh, it's believed that owls don't see color quite as well as humans do because they don't have as many cones, the, the, the cells that are made for seeing color. I have Hammy because he is not releasable. When he was a young owl learning how to hunt and fly on his own, he was hit by a car. This happens often with owls. They're often hunting on the roadside where the, there's shortcut grass and they can see their prey better. And unfortunately, when he, he was hit by a car, but somebody found him and they brought him to a wildlife rehabilitator. He has soft tissue damage to both wings that's severe enough. He can fly, but he loses altitude, so he would not be able to sustain himself in the wild. He is 16 years old. And that's actually just a spring chicken for a great horned owl. They've been known to live 30 to 40 years. So hopefully he's got many years ahead of him. Okay, so uh, moving on from the owls, we have the uh, Carassiformes, which are the kingfishers. 
And here we have a gorgeous belted kingfisher. This is a female. The kingfishers are one of the few examples where the female is more brightly colored than the male. So the female has this orange band here. And maybe that they, the female can afford to because they nest in hollow cavities and banks, sometimes going five feet up into the bank, um, deep, deeply hidden back in there. Anyway, uh, the belted kingfisher is uh, quite common here. And then we have uh, the, the woodpeckers, the Pisiformes are pretty closely related. Uh, this is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. So it doesn't, the other uh, woodpeckers that don't have woodpecker in the name would be the flickers, like the Northern flicker. The yellow-bellied sapsucker is common here in winter only. And, uh, oh, and I had mentioned earlier that the woodpeckers use their tail as a brace. They have stiff pointed tail feathers and they have zygodactyl feet, which means that um, two toes face forward and two toes face backward for gripping. And they actually have a super long tongue, which is important for probing into the cavities that they've made to try to get insects. So the tongue of a woodpecker is similar to what we see in, in hummingbirds. The tongue tendon actually wraps around the um, back of the head and ends, so it comes around the side here and wraps around the back of the head and ends up here. So it's a very long probing tongue. Okay, back to our other convergent evolution birds of prey, the order Falconiformes. Um, you know, it never surprised me when I heard that they were closely related to parrots. I was like, yeah, my kestrels, they never reminded me of hawks at all. I mean, they've got this blocky parrot-like head. They've got a parrot-like bill. They hold their prey like a parrot. You know, they're, they're, um, like parrots only better. Oh, sorry. Sorry for all you parrot lovers. But anyway, the American kestrel is our smallest falcon. Super gorgeous bird. This is a female. They have really long pointed wings and uh, kind of a tiger shaped pattern. And as I said, they're related to parrots, the Sitica formis. John was with me when we, we were birding when I took that picture. Uh, this is the monk parakeet. And it's, uh, a bird that was introduced to this country through the pet trade, but it's here to stay now, apparently. Uh, they're from Argentina originally. And our native parrot, of course, was the Carolina parakeet that used to be quite a common bird and um, humans killed them all. Uh, the order Passeriformes is uh, a huge order of bird that contains uh, probably half the birds known, to, more than half the birds known to science. Uh, and when people talk about passerines, they mean that they're talking about these perching birds, these birds in this order. So this is a hooded warbler. And uh, it's all, this, this order includes all the songbirds. So we're gonna look at quite a few represent, representatives of the order. Passeriformes. All these birds have what's called the perching bird arrangement to their foot. And what that means is that um, in the relaxed position, the foot is closed on the branch. So the bird actually has to contract its muscles to release the branch. And so that, that allows it to sleep perching. And uh, so anyway, you can see here that the Ten, the, the tendon for the muscle goes under the foot and connects to these digits here. And the tendon has like a gripping mechanism inside of it. So th these are the perching birds, the passeriforms or passerines. And there are a number of families, like this is the family Tyrannidae, and it includes the um, flycatchers and phoebes. And this is the great crested flycatcher which is a common breeder here. And it is uh, bringing food to its young right here. But um, they, these birds are in the genus Myarchus. And the reason I mention that is because you will hear birders talk about, oh yeah, I had a Myarchus flycatcher. I couldn't tell what it was. So that's another example of when you're like, okay, I, you know, maybe I got a look at the bird, but not a good enough look to identify it to species. But I could tell from that pattern like we look again at this, uh, this gray to yellow 
with the rufous tail pattern and, and that, you know, fly catchery head that it's like, okay, it was some kind of myarchus, but I'm not sure what. And in this case, this is an ash throated fly catcher that's here in winter time. It's a pretty good bird. Okay, then there's the family Corvidae. So the corvids, as they're called, are the crows and the jays and the magpies. So if you hear somebody talking about a corvid, they're talking about crows and jays, etc. Uh, our common, one of our common corvids is the blue jay. That's quite a handsome bird. Thanks, Mark, for these pictures, except I took this one here. Um, the uh, the crows that we have here are the American crow and the fish crow, and they're probably best distinguished by voice. The fish crow has a more nasal voice, and the American crow is just really obnoxious. <laughs> it's what, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Then we have chickadees and titmice. These are still passerines that are common here. The Carolina chickadee. Please do not, as a beginner, tell somebody you saw a black-capped chickadee. They're going to be like, ah. What a, what a novice mo move, right? Carolina chickadees we have here. The black capped chickadees are in, uh, in the east. And then we have uh, the tufted titmouse. The Carolina chickadee says chickadee dee dee. So it says its name. It has a bunch of other sayings too. The vocalizations between the tufted titmouse and the Carolina chickadee are quite similar. So you'd really want to study them to make sure you can tell some of them are. So, but um, the tufted titmouse is the only one that says Peter, 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 Peter. It's calling Peter Yaki. The Carolina, uh, the wrens include our Carolina wren, that, that's the one that's here that uh, year round that nests here. And look, Joan Garvey got this beautiful picture of a fledgling baby Carolina wren. So notice how long the tail is in the, in the parent. And then look at this little stubby tail on the baby. Also notice how bright the plumage is in the adult and how dull it is in the baby. They have a, a molt before they, uh, 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 I guess it's within a couple of months that they get their adult harder plumage and brighter plumage. But, and you can also see in this bird, see this yellow corners to the mouth there, that fleshy yellow mouth. That's a sure sign that you're looking at a baby. In some birds, like in the crows, it's pink there, but it'll be real fleshy corners to the mouth, signaling baby. Oh, um, and the Carolina wren has a number of vocalizations. It's quite quite a vocabulary. Then we have thrushes and bluebirds, like this American robin. The robins, uh, there are some robins that nest here year-round, for example, uh, in Audubon Park, but they're actually pretty rare as nesters, and they get common this time of year when we're invaded by them, robins from all over the the country, especially from the north, and they're coming here to eat our uh, holly berries and such. Okay, here's an eastern bluebird. This is a gorgeous male. Uh, bluebirds mostly nest on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, but in wintertime they can be found on the south shore. And uh, they're a group of birds known as the mimid thrushes. These are again all passerines, passeriformes. And those are the mockingbirds, thrashers, and catbirds. And their voices are all very similar, but you can distinguish them by how many times they repeat things. Just mentioning that when you, I'd like to do a course on bird vocalizations. Uh, the mockingbird has uh, a beautiful call that sounds like Well, my mouth's a little dry. That didn't come out so good. Anyway, cedar waxwing. Cedar waxwings are only here in the winter time. They're beautiful, beautiful birds. Note that it's a masked bandit. It's got a beautiful mask. It's crested. It's got this feather crest here. It's uh, got black lures. It's got a beautiful yellow tail tip. And there are some orange markings on the back of the wing, or red orange waxy. The reason they're called wax wings is because they have waxy markings on the back of the wing that are the color of these berries that this bird was eating. And they have a really thin call that's a 
These are pine warblers, or this is one pine warbler that was at my feeder with a tufted titmouse in the background there. Uh, this one was eating suet. And pine warblers are common in wintertime, just about anywhere. Uh, they can be quite dull. And when they're very dull, so this is a male in breeding plumage, but when they're dull, they can look like almost anything. So when you're sitting there with a warbler that has two faint wing bars and you can't figure out what it is and it's super dull looking, there's a good chance that it's a pine warbler. Uh, the cardinals, buntings, and grosbeaks. And of course, this would be like the bird everybody wants to see, the painted bunting. Thank you, Joan, for this picture. This is a male painted bunting. The females are entirely green, like about this color here. So blue head, look at that gorgeous, gorgeous red eye ring that's fleshy. Um, the red throat and belly, the red under tail coverts, and this lighter yellowish green back with the green on the on the uh, second uh, on the tertiary is really gorgeous bird. Then we have blackbirds and grackles, cowbirds and meadowlarks and orioles, and so these are our ichthyrids, as they're known, the family ichthyridae. And this is the red-winged blackbird. So this just is showing how different the male that's black with these red epaulets and the female look. And uh, they are, of course, very common here. They are here year round and they get in large groups in winter and eat all your seeds at your feeder. The red winged blackbird male says, conquery, conquery. Very loud, explosive sound. And finally, we have birds like the house sparrow. Now, the house sparrow is something that you're going to see commonly in the city. And it's an introduced bird. When the European settlers came here, they missed some of their old species. So they brought to America and released the house sparrow, also known as the European sparrow or Eurasian sparrow, and the uh, European starling, and also brought with them the rock pigeon. And so these birds are non-natives. And in some cases, they really pose problems for our native species. Uh, in the case of this house sparrow, it's building a nest in a purple martin house. And so they're taking over the nesting areas of purple martins. And, you know, some people say, oh, yeah, but I like the sparrows. Well, they'll do stuff like poke holes in the eggs of the purple martins and kill the babies and build their nest right over them. So don't don't be too kind to those house sparrows. Or, I mean, you can, it's your own business. But And uh, finally, we have... The limpkin, that's, this is an example of a bird. Oh, and this is not in the order pass or reform. sorry, this is a waiting bird, but the limpkins are making a range expansion into Louisiana and to parts of the Southeastern United States. Uh, they're mainly following the distribution of invasive apple snails, like the channeled apple snail that's, that's, just taken over our waterways. I'm sure you've seen in the canals those, I meant to put in a picture, but those masses of bright pink eggs that you see along the canals, those are for the apple snails. And those big giant snails that you see, well, that's why the limpkins have expanded their range. And um, Colby uh, got this picture in his backyard in downtown uh, Lafayette of a limpkin in his backyard just the other day. But these birds are actually have been documented breeding out in our marshes. And uh, so it's exciting. Who doesn't want to see a limpkin? And the, the next bird I'm waiting for is the snail kite. And that would be a great addition to Louisiana. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see whether that happens or not. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in and hanging in there. And uh,